Welcome back. In honor of Black History Month, we're highlighting work that further analyzes the contributions of Black leaders and trailblazers. The Bronx African American History Project dedicates time to research that highlights the accomplishments and contributions of Black Americans right here in the Bronx. Founder and director of the Bronx African American History Project, Dr. Mark Nason, joins me to discuss this effort. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so happy to be here. Now, I want to talk about Black History Month just in general. Can you talk about the origins, you know, of this month and, you know, why we acknowledge it here in the U.S.? Well, I think this started with the historian Carter Woodson uh, in, uh, even before the Great Depression, who felt that um, our universities um, and our schools were not uh, including the contributions of African Americans in uh, what they were presenting, and that uh, organizations had to do this independently. Uh, so um, this began outside of schools and eventually entered schools. And after the civil rights movement, it became policy of many public schools around the country. But none of this came without a fight. And this is particularly important now that in, in many parts of the country, uh, African-American history is being pushed out of schools. We have to remember we had a fight to get it in. And, and Dr. Woodson was probably more responsible for this than anyone. I'm so glad that you brought that up because even now it's, you know, it's still very controversial. And, you know, I want to know, um, in your opinion, why do you think we're seeing this reaction um, and just the strong pushback towards, you know, Black History Month being taught in schools? Because, I think it's because we found out so much about things that happened in the past that were kept from view that um, present the country in a very different light than most people have viewed it. For example, uh, take uh, the destruction of Black Wall Street in Tulsa in 1921. Um, this was the wealthiest Black community in the country that was burned to the ground, um, a 36 uh, square block area destroyed, um, uh, scores of businesses uh, burned and uh, hundreds of people killed, thousands pushed into exile. No one knew about this. Um, and if we're talking about, you know, obstacles to black wealth creation in the United States, we have many episodes of mass murder of prosperous black communities. Another one of these took place in the state of Florida in Rosewood in the 1920s. So a lot of, we have a, a lot of young historians who are uncovering this, and I think it's very threatening information, especially because it encourages a serious discourse about reparations. Um, and, um, I, I think once the true picture of, and, and we're not just talking about enslavement, we're right. talking about things that were happening in the 20th century when black people, you know, were making progress economically, and that was perceived as a deadly threat um, and an, an, an incitement to violence. We, we, that's that's a pretty disturbing subject, isn't it? Right. And, and I think people are afraid of having that discussed. Well, I'm I'm re actually really glad that you're here and that we're having this discussion uh, because a huge part of your work is, you know, analyzing African-American history here in New York, but specifically the Bronx. Um, I think that's so important because most of the time when we do hear about these stories, they're usually um, from different parts throughout the country. So first, can you just talk about your organization or your, you know, the Black African-American History Project okay. before we jump into that? Yeah, sure. This basically started 20 years ago when I was approached by the uh, the archivist of the Bronx County Historical Society who said there was a tremendous community demand for information about African-American history in the Bronx, and there wasn't any. 
So could my colleagues and I try to create, you know, a database to meet the community demand? I looked into it and found this. There were half a million people of African descent in the Bronx, and they were invisible to scholars, to the media, even to the major center for African-American research in New York, the Schomburg Center, who published the book called The Black New Yorkers, 423 pages, three pages in the Bronx. So I said, okay, how do, when you have this large group of people who are invisible to the researchers, what do you do? You do oral histories. So I contacted a former student of mine named Vicki Archibald who lived in the Patterson houses in the 50s. Her brother was the great basketball player, Nate Tiny Archibald. And I asked her, would you um, do an interview me describing what it was like growing up in public housing in the Bronx in the 1950s and, and 60s and how that contributed to where you are today, which was as a social work supervisor um, in Long Island. Uh, Vicky said, sure, we spent three hours talking and she created this incredible picture of public housing as this incredibly supportive environment filled with people from different backgrounds, um, with great social services, with people who looked after one another's families. And it defies all the stereotypes we have about the projects um, and also about you know, what people thought black life in the Bronx was. So I did this interview thinking I'm going to wait a month. Her friends started contacting me. When are you going to interview us? We've been trying to tell this story for 30 years. Wow. So I, I, I started interviewing like 20 different people from the Patterson houses, all of whom are now successful professionals. And it was one story, another, which reinforced what Vicky had told me. And then the New York Times sent a reporter to cover what I was doing. And it, it, it appeared in the metro section of the Times. And then people from all over the Bronx said, how can you tell the story of African-American life in the Bronx without interviewing us? And the, the, the most of these inquiries came from a neighborhood called Morrisania, which was just south of Cretona Park basically between Webster Avenue on, on the west and um, uh, Prospect Avenue in the east. And we started doing interviews there. And there we came upon an amazing story. It was a black middle class community that emerged in the 1930s when black families from Harlem saw an opportunity to move uh, to a, a place with better schools, better shopping, bigger apartments and also where they wouldn't experience racial hostility from the, uh, the, the existing population. I, I want to so interject really quickly, because you, you mentioned school, so it just, it just came into my mind. I know that you are in partnership with Fordham, or to some extent, can you, can you uh, clarify or talk a little bit more about that partnership here in the Bronx? Okay, I'm a professor at Fordham, and uh, so I did... Oh, I've been at Fordham for 52 years. I came here in 19, 1970, and I'm in two departments, uh, the Department of African and African American Studies and History. I was also very active in a lot of community groups in the Bronx over the years. So when I started this research, people kind of knew me enough to say, we can trust him to tell our stories. But what I want to say is, it was the people telling the stories who drove this, not me. When I came upon this Morrisania community, I didn't know that this portion of the Bronx produced more varieties of popular music than any place in the country in the world in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I learned this from people who were, you know, volunteering to be interviewed. Now, I had known hip hop started in the Bronx. I knew that. I knew a little bit about like the doo-wop singers because I grew up singing doo-wop and knew some of the groups. What I didn't realize is there was an incredible live jazz scene in the Morrisania section of the Bronx. And there was right next to an incredible live Latin music scene. 
and that the two groups cross fertilized one another. So in, in the 40s and 50s, you know, you had uh, bebop jazz, um, you had uh, mambo, and then you had various forms which fused the two. And you also had doo-wop, you know, the, the urban harmonic singing in this neighborhood uh, where you had two pioneering groups. The Chords, 1954, produced the first urban harmonic record to sell a million records, Shaboom, and the Chantels, the first urban harmonic group by women to sell a million records, all in one neighborhood. And the schools played a role in this because they had great music programs. So That's no amazing. one knew this before the people in the community were telling us this. And then something, we, we started publicizing it. Then the schools got involved because... I, I want to you know, interject quickly because we have about a, a minute left. We only have a oh. minute left, but I, I definitely want to get into this. It's just so much rich history that I didn't even know existed in the Bronx. So I'm so happy that you shared some of that. Can you just like, talk about, uh, you know, just the importance of having this available to so many people who okay. currently live we here? We now have, we've been doing this for 20 years. We have a digital archive that anyone can access. Uh, we have you know, 320 oral history interviews, all of which are transcribed. We have 22 essays, which anybody can use for their classes or community groups. It's all free. It's all there. People from all over the world access this. So if you want information on Bronx African-American history, it's all there for you free through these links. All right. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. This was a really amazing conversation and I already learned so much. So truly, thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. You know, uh, it was, uh, I'm so glad I got to talk about what's going on in the country and how we have to fight again to make sure this history is told because it's empowering. All right, thank you so much. We'll be right back with more Open right after this.